be reliant on advertising. Um, so, what? So, I'll tell you a little bit about myself first. Oh, the way the workshops can work is I'm going to talk for like 10 minutes and like throw out some ideas. And then at the end of the 10 minutes, we're going to um, decide what we want to talk about as a group. And then we'll talk about whatever that is because it could go in whatever direction. Um, I've been doing beans for about eight years. I started my zine called Fuck Tooth when I, in like uh, early 91. And um, I'm going on, Theo and I, Theo was in here. Um, <laughs> Theo and I are doing a split issue. That's the newest issue. It's going to be number 24. So you think, okay, eight years, 24 issues. That's not that much, but not like maximum rock and roll or something. You know, every month I can never do that. Um, but I also do the senior book, which I've been doing for about three years. The third edition is at the printer now. So I have a lot of experience in it. So, like, I worked at Maximum Rock and Roll, and I've worked on tons of things, like side projects and things. So I've got a lot of experience, and that's kind of where I've come from. Um, I want to do things for a really long time. And so I'm trying to figure out ways to make zines more viable and less of a financial burden on everybody because I know that I'm lucky because I have a day job that pays a lot of money, you know, because like I have skills that I can use, you know, but at the same time that's a 40 hour a week job and then I come home and do this for another 40 hours, you know, so I'm trying to find ways to make zines more of a viability or an option for people. So. I'm not gonna follow my notes. So she's like looking at my notes. It's like that. Okay. Um, so there's a few. The, well, the first thing I want to talk about is there's a few simple ways to kind of make your zine not to okay in simple terms to sell more of your zine. Okay, which don't rely on advertising and kind of getting it, um, which is a way to make more money without raising the cover price because when you make more, like if you're doing printing. The more copies you make, the less it costs per copy and that kind of thing. So being able to sell more is good. And um, it also goes hand in hand with something I think is really important with advertising and fundraising. And I think the most important thing is to establish a good reputation and a good consistent track record. And that is not necessarily to put your zine out on time, but put your zine out when you say it's going to come out, like, you know, within a month. Not be like, oh, I'm going to put my zine out next month, it comes out next year. You know, that kind of thing. I mean, it happens, but that's not a good way to, people can't rely on when it's coming out and they can't, it's hard for people to maintain some kind of connection with you if you only put an issue out, like, every two years. If you're not, like, doing anything, like, people who buy your zine only once in a while, it's hard for them to become more familiar with you. And I think that's something that I've had a lot of success with is putting this thing out like two or three times a year. People maintain a kind of like, it's kind of like name identity thing. It's like people aren't going to forget about you like after a year. And they're not going to, when they see your zine again, they're going to be like, well, that's kind of familiar, but I don't really remember what it was. So being consistent is very important. And also, if you are trying to get advertising, that's something that advertisers should really look for. It's like how often do you come out? Do you come out when you say you're going to? Um, and it's also, I think, important, the other important thing is to establish a good reputation. Like, when you're dealing with distributors and stuff, just be very, be very honest. And, like, also a good reputation when people write you, bring them back. You know, that's, like, a very simple thing that not a lot of people do. It's like, and especially if someone writes you and they send you a note with their order, write them a note back. That's something that really helps <laughs> the way people view you, and I think if people can connect with you as a person, it really um, it helps your zine a lot because they identify you with your zine, and it's not just something that's something that zines have that's valuable as opposed to Spin Magazine. Because with Spin Magazine, there's no identity, but that there's no person through that. It's like a corporation produced that, and there's no person behind it. Well, no one person. So that's important is to. Um, be consistent, respond to people, talk to people like when you go to shows and stuff, and especially in your hometown. And the other thing is to be visible, which is um, write letters to the editor. And, you know, like on Planet, when you read something that you disagree with, um, contribute to, like if someone's doing a comp scene, contribute a page, or just being involved in other projects. When people start becoming familiar with you and your ideas and the name of your scene, that's going to help also. 
repeatable time to apply with you. Um, and then the other thing about kind of selling um, more zines is to, Theo's going to talk more about this. I don't know what kind of bent he's taking, but about smaller distribu dis distributors is to, my whole success, I think, is from not writing off small distributors. Because now a lot of people, they put out like one or two issues and they think, oh, why isn't Tower picking this up? And why isn't, you know, why isn't, you know, this big distributor taking this? And I'm, I feel like I'm one of those people who goes, oh, in the old days, it was different. But I didn't, the first big distributor I got was with issue 16, which means I was doing my zine for like four or five years before I got a distributor that would take more than 10 copies or 20 copies. You know, so I think it's important. But if you think, okay, if I have 10 people who each take 20 copies, that's 200. That's a good number, you know, it's a substantial number. So, but then there's the issue of not, those people not being reliable and that kind of thing. And so getting people to pay up front for it, especially if you're doing like five copies, it's not that big of an issue. But um, I think it's important to not set your sights too big in some cases and not expect it to be really big, because then you get discouraged and it doesn't really work. Um, so I've been trying a few other things. So, okay, those are things that I think that are most important when you're first starting out, is to maintain a good track record and be consistent, and that's what's gonna help you kind of lay the groundwork for doing your zine for a long time. Um, but once you start to get bigger, there's some things that you can do, and this is what I need help with. This is what I kind of want to talk about, what options there are besides advertising for fundraising. And there's like the standard options of having benefit shows, which is good if you have a good small scene. You can have friends or bands. You can do like a local show or whatever, or other kind of like fundraisers. I mean, a lot of people who do zines also sell records or do a label because that's where the money is. But I'm never going to do that, so I don't really think that's an option. Um, and then... I've also started something called sponsorship, which is used a lot by, you know, other independent press that's not in the punk scene and a lot of activist groups and things, but it's never been really widely used within punk, and that's basically like where, for the Dean Yearbook, which is a big project, someone said, I tell people, the cover price is $6, and I'm like, if you send me a donation of $25 or more, then, you know, I'll list you in there in the introduction. This is Sarah was talking about that's how she got all the money to fu fund her movie by sending, telling people that she would lift them in the credits if they sent her a donation of $100. And then for Fuck Tooth I started it, it was like if you send me a donation of $10 or more because the cover price is only $2. And I got a few takers, you know, but I kind of think that that is really only an option for people who have done their zine for a couple of years or have done a lot of issues. So I don't really know if that's an option for everybody. Um, so, I think, I mean, because I think there's less options of ways to bring in money, which I like to kind of create new ones, like things that people have never done before, so that's what I'm trying to concentrate on. That's why I think it's important to do the simple things that can sell your zine more. There's also, a, um, something I forgot to mention earlier is a few layout things that'll sell your zine quicker. Um, and this is just, like when I talk to distributors, they're like, well, you should do this. This will help or whatever. And one is, when you lay out your zine, make sure the title of your zine is on the top of the page. Because that way, when it's on a rack, like in a magazine rack, people can read it. Um, it also has to be clear. Like, the cover has to be really clear, like the name. And I always put the price on there, even though Theo's like, again, the price. No, that's not true. You just don't? Uh, I was going to say, I have in my notes here, just briefly, I'm going to do a talk at three about both for zine editors, how to get your zine distributed, and also for people that are interested in starting a small distribution for mail order, who, or who have one, or one tips, or want to exchange ideas. So it'll be kind of a two-part thing, how to get it distributed, and how to start a distribution. And one of the things I have in my notes is to make sure you have a price on the cover if you're sure that that price is the one you can work with. Because when you give something to a store or you give something to a distributor, there are kind of standards as far as if you're selling something in a store, they'll only pay you 
of the cover price, or less and they 50. keep the rest. Yeah, I mean, well, a distributor would be maybe 50 to 55 percent. They would take. You would get 45 to 50 percent. So. So after you figure out how figure much you out. want to charge, then it's. I mean, it's really helpful to have the price on the cover um, for for stores and for distros who are selling it and stuff. And the other, another simple thing that you can do is <coughs> use either colored ink on the cover or a colored paper cover because it kind of sets it out for all of the other zines that are all white and people it looks a little more professional, um, which is what stores and distributors look for. And also stapling is really important. If you don't staple, you use some other method. It's just not going to work. It's okay. I mean, it's kind of like, this is kind of like, if you only make like 50 copies of your zine and that's what you want to do, this that's fine. This is kind of like the talk for people who want to make zines that make, you know, between like 200 and like a thousand copies per zine. You know, this isn't, and I'm not like, because I'm not, I don't want to be as big as Punk Planet or anything ever. So you're never like going to get that kind of advice from me because I don't know it. But, um, so those are some things that, so I concentrate more on like how to sell my thing better and marketing like Sarah was talking about because there are so few ways to bring in money to zines because people just don't want to spend money. Okay, so that's basically all the topics that I wanted to talk about just to give us a few kind of simple things that you help enhance and then talk about how I think it's important to move away from advertising based um, money. So I want to know what other people are interested in talking about. Because if we want, if people want to talk about like how to get advertising or whatever, that's fine. Or um, I'd kind of like to maybe brainstorm on what other options there are to bring in money. Um, if anyone has any ideas and wants to talk about them. Or does anyone have any topics they want to discuss? Scott, that's a good idea. Stand behind me, Scott? Okay, people people uh, people write me letters like I get like five letters a day asking asking for advertising uh, for people and there's some things that I look at and then some things that I really don't look at. Um, but I guess I want to I want to bring that up because there are some ways that people I don't know talking to me like I could probably tell you what what a label is looking at. Do you have a few? Should, should I, help, should I bring him? it up right now? Sure. Okay. Um, you should stand up. <laughs> la, 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 la. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the first, the first thing is that uh, you should always send a copy of your zine with, um, you know, with, in, in an envelope. And what I always look at is a handwritten letter. Like if the handwritten letter is like separate, like. Um, like I like it. I like it if it's sent in an envelope. Um, if the letter inside, if the letter inside is like personalized, yeah. If it's personalized, I I look at that especially. Um, and if someone sends like something really like kooky, like let's see, like stupid cards or like or a drawing they did. This, this is a picture my brother did of a dinosaur. <laughs> you know, something ridiculous like that. I'm like, oh wow, this is really. Cool. Um, I so not maybe, it, not maybe everybody is looking at <laughs> <laughs> like, hate that. I'm like, tell me all these little toys and glitter, and I hated it. Like, it's yeah. Yeah. Oh. I mean, because especially, like, some of the bigger labels would get annoyed by that. But some of the smaller labels, they look for something with personality. Yeah. So it kind of depends on what you're looking for. I, I absolutely, well, I hate, hate getting form letters for anything. And I just, like, I wind up, I put them in a pile. And, like, they're the la absolute last thing that I will ever look at. And generally, I don't even get to them. You know, I like, I'm like, like the same thing goes for demos or whatever. You know, like, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, demos, but uh, um, so I don't know. So I have these piles and piles of zines. <coughs> the first ones that I generally look at are uh, Xerox zines because I feel like those are going to be a lot more personal. And, and, you know, the, the kids aren't going to be doing these in quantities of like, you know, of like more than a few hundred. Uh, so I like, so I take a uh, you know, I take a peek at these, and I'm like, wow, these are really, really cool. And that's what um, I look at. One commenting about xeroxing versus printing is that xeroxing can look good. Either way, it's not like oh, to get distributed, you have to be printed because it looks better. If you do a xeroxing and it 
copied cleanly and it's readable, you won't have any problems. You just, it has to look good. If it's un... Messy scenes are okay, but they're not going to ever get a lot of advertising because people feel like they're inaccessible because they're difficult. But again, if you're not trying to get big, that's okay. Alright. Okay. okay. Um, I like scenes with silk screen covers. Um, and people who do something that are just really cool with the layout, like you know, they'll cut up, they'll cut up the old pictures from magazines and just do individualized things like that. Uh, I'm like totally into. It. When I get the when I get scenes that are all chock full of adver advertising and stuff like that, I I generally I either shy away from them or I see like well you know how how well are they distributed already you know so like there's this there's this I don't know like maybe that's kind of unfair that I don't really I don't really help out the like advertising based scenes along the way but when they finally get big actually like that's it kind of suits my purposes because it's it's expensive to advertise. Like even if it's like a twenty-five dollar ad here and there, like there are like ten zillion different zines, and I can't, you know, I can't advertise each one. And I have to be very, very careful, you know, about what I, you know, what I choose to put put into it. Um, the other thing is, the other thing uh, that's really cool is when zines write to me and they say, "Hey, uh, would you be willing to trade your records for advertising?" And I think, wow, that's really super cool because that way they're starting their own distros just trying my stuff and they're helping me, you know, and, and they're helping me, I'm helping them, and there's like this exchange going, and there's like no cash involved in that, and I, and I that's something I really prefer. So, um, I don't know, I think that's a really good fundraising tactic, like to do your, you know, to just start a little distro or something like that. People advertise their zines, like in other zines? Yeah, um, yeah. It's, very, it's kind of uncommon. Like a lot of people who do small things trade ads with other small scenes, um, but because most scene editors don't have a lot of money, it's like it's rare to see, like in Maximum, there's like two scene ads ever, you know, very, it's very rare. And it's like the big ones. zines like Punk Planet and Maximum and Jersey Beat, they don't need to advertise. So it's kind of like the ones who have the money who can afford a lot of advertising don't need to advertise. Um, I used to advertise my zine when I was, um, like around issue 12 and 13 or so, so it's like a couple years ago. And um, what we did was maximum smallest ad size is like two, two by five, like a business card size. And me and someone else would split that size. We each had a little square, so it was like 20, it's, it was like $15 each. I can't even remember the 15. ad rate. Yeah, because it's in the ad, the smallest ad size is like 30 bucks or something for the small one. So we each paid like fifteen dollars, but the kind of thing—the thing with that is, I never got good response from that. Like no one ever wrote me and said, "Oh, I saw your ad." Because you can't put with a zine, it's hard to put enough information in an ad that said that'll tell somebody like what the character of your zine is. You know, it'll tell you tell them what band interviews are in there or whatever, but not what the character is. And um, so I never got any like direct response from it. Um, I think it's helpful because it's like a name recognition Probably thing. Be better off going with other smaller scenes anyway. Yeah. You know. The bigger ones, are, like you were saying, most of them get most of the money from records. Right. Those are the big ones I'm dealing with. I can say something on that note. When I first started my zine, I would just take a classified ad out in the back of Maximum Rock and Roll. And I think it was like $4, and then I would probably get like four zine sales. Like, not very much, but it, it, <coughs> it evened out, basically. Right. But it's probably better than taking out, like, a picture ad. The, they always seem just way too expensive. You evened know? out and got your name out there. Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, the, getting people to recognize your name and connect it with you, and like, oh, this is a zine. And it's kind of one of those things that when people see your name around enough, then they'll get it. They'll be like, well, I see this everywhere. I see, oh, they, this person wrote, I saw this classified, and then I saw a review. <coughs> And then I saw it like, oh, okay, I've seen that. But before, like, yeah, I did this, it could be these five other names. It's so wrong. It's just, yeah, it's a really good thing. And also, um, like, the name of your theme complaint issue, but I don't think it's that big of an issue. Because, like, a lot of people were like, oh, your theme has a swear word in the title. It's never going to get big. And it's like, the people who I'm distributing through, it doesn't matter. You know, it's like, Tree of Knowledge is not going to refuse you because you have a swear word. You know, it's just it's, it's confusing or people can't pronounce it. 
that would mm -hmm. hinder it. But. I think it's important to kind of get back to the idea of different ways we can raise money without advertising. Because I've thought a lot about, you know, if we're going to be a true counterculture or our own independent culture, and, you know, I can see through the years of my involvement in it, like, there's been a lot of growth in, like, sort of peripheral things that, like, people doing screen printing, or, like, punks with presses, people doing like, t-shirts and stuff like that. Are we going to just mimic in a smaller way the, the system, you know, that's prevalent throughout the U.S., you know, basically the capitalist system and how they do that kind of stuff? Or are we going to figure out different ways to, you know, to raise money to get our, our products out? You know, are we going to rely on just our own independent but parallel system? Or are we going to figure out a different way to yes, do yes. that? Yeah, I think I think what Jen said earlier about like spin being like a corporate entity where you don't know a person and like zines not being like that because there are people that you connect to. I mean, I think that's like a fundamental difference. Like even if we are advertising and doing these things that are very like traditional, we're not doing it on the same scale or with the same impersonal contact. No, no, come back. Right. Come back. Okay, let's go okay. to you and then Joel. Oh, wait, I remember. Okay, I remember. go ahead. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, internet is really it is really good. Um, and I, I've I found some really, really awesome zines on the internet that are just completely Are you talking online. about e-zines or print zines that are advertised on the internet? No, um, e-zines. Uh, um, Easings, but get um, but ones that trade advertising and trade, and trade banners, and, or is that kind of separate from this? I have no experience with electronic means, and I kind of view it as kind of a. We had this. Did we have this discussion about class issues yesterday? No, we certainly did briefly. Not. Okay, <laughs> we have like three words, I think. Right. <laughs> so, but I think I mean we can talk about that later, like the whole like easy versus print scene okay. thing. But I think we'll get back to that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just there's a lot of talk about taking out ads for your zine or whatever. And when I first started in Spectacle, I mean, the first issue I printed, the first pressing, or the first printing of the first issue, I printed 10 copies. And I kept it mine. Yeah, and I was just like, I, you know, I didn't know. And with doing very little taking out ads, like, I may have taken out just a handful of ads for the zine. Like, Tree of Knowledge is kind of different now. We sort of do some limited advertising in zines, we'll buy ads in like Heart Attack or Punk Plan or something. But with the zine, when I was just doing the zine, rare, I did a few classifieds, like uh, Courtney was talking about, which is like three bucks, you know, and it's nothing big, no one's gonna flip through the zine and be like, whoa, the new one. It's like, well, that. But, but see, I think my goal in life is to make people as excited about a new zine as they are as excited about a baby be, and a new record. That'd be great That's day. my goal. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and as an alternative, I mean, from that, like Spectacle three and a half, I moved 5,000 with no advertising and or no taking out ads. But what I have done, and it's proven to be a lot cheaper <coughs> and a lot more effective for me anyway, is to do things kind of like this. This is one for alien stickers, but to print little flyers, this, what I'm doing is just a sixth of an eight and a half by 11 page, about five by two and a half or something, and just send those out, and then, you know, an envelope. Well, every time I write a letter to somebody, every time, well, it's a little different because we have tree of knowledge, and for everyone who's seeing me distribute, we have a deal with them that they'll put these out in their own individual orders or in their own correspondence. But through that, like, you, know, you can print, print 50,000 or 10,000 little flyers. Ours are two-sided. On one side, they have an advertisement that tells what Tree of Knowledge is, and tells how much the catalog is, and has our address. And on the back side, we made several ones that have some sort of little blurb about corporate control in the media, or something, just so people can get an idea of, of what we actually are about. And, and just from that, sending those out, I think that's one of the most effective things we can do, and it's so much cheaper than 
like picking out like a sixty dollar ad and some zine. Pretty, I mean, we don't have a lot of surplus money for advertising. So and that's the thing with when you do like an ad in that phone that it only lasts for one month. Right, and then it's gone. Whereas like you start sending these out, you just keep sending them out. <laughs> and all your correspondence and all your friends that do zines and they each put them in theirs or just put in their mail. And then it just spreads, it's just like a huge branching, you know, exponential thing. So I'm recommending this to anybody who's trying to get the word out about their zine. This is a real effective tool. Especially in a sticker form, too, because then it gives you a little bit more permanence sure. and you can include something character of your zine on it. One thing that I've really found helpful is contributing to other people's zines as far as getting exposure. And, that, and I really like that better than just taking out an ad or something like that because you're, well, you're really contributing to someone else's zine and you're helping yourself so. out. Somebody, when they read your article, they get an idea of what mm, you're about. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, I like this idea, I'm going to ask this person to see. So, that's a good tool. So what other suggestions do people have about either gaining exposure or... Um, getting non-profit status. I don't really think that's an option for a lot of people. Why not? So you have to do all the filing and there's a fee and... Well, a little bit of fee, but then after it's, it's, like after it's free. Dollar. No. You do advertising. Uh, if you have it's like no, if you get, <laughs> no, if you get, you can get nonprofit status for forty-five dollars, and yeah. you can, you, you can, uh, you just have to get a talk to a lawyer, and this is good for your own experience anyway. Like, talk to a lawyer who will do this pro bono, which means for free, um, and and say, look, you no, know, I, I run a magazine. Uh, this is what I do. You know, I put out a few copies. It's a personal magazine, and I need a little bit of help. And sometimes some lawyers, you know, will be thrilled. They'll, you know, to do this, it's, you know, an hour worth of their time. And uh, and they'll feel like, you know, they're actually helping, you know, and the kind of usually the more evil the lawyer I've found, the more they're willing to help you on, like, littler projects, you know, because, like, they feel like, you know, what is it So what does this give you? Okay, non it gives you non-profit non -profit status. It's a 501c3, um, which, which is the form that, or, the status that, that you wind up getting. Do you, you know, uh, do you want to talk more? Um, I'm not sure how I would use that with a zine, though. Like, I've, I've like been involved with nonprofit status. With the cafe we're opening, we, there's another, there's a coalition that's working with the cafe, and that's nonprofit and with a corporation. And this, we had, we got a lawyer to do it for free, to get his corporation <coughs> status, his corporation status, and to work on a 501c3 status. The thing with that, I'm not sure how you're saying it would relate would to. You get grant, you can get grants. Yeah, you can get grant. You can apply for grants. grants. And the, thing is, yeah. and, and the thing is, you're, you're not talking about needing, you know, twenty thousand dollars worth of grants, which a lot of nonprofits need. You're talking about you know, saying, hey, you know, I'm soliciting for a twenty dollar grant or something like that. And like a lot of, a lot of smaller arts organizations are like, wow, that's cool. And a lot of, uh, and a, you know, a lot of your parents' friends or something like that might want to make a tax deductible donation. Especially if you <coughs> advertise for them or something. So yeah. I think that's can you carry yeah. advertising. In, in your zine, uh, yeah, you can. Another yeah. thing about having nonprofit status is that you don't have to pay sales tax for business things at places like Office Max or other things. So but you don't have to anyway. What businesses don't have to that kind of stuff? You you have have if you had business, if you, had, if you were a corporation, I guess you could do that too. Yeah. But you have to. You can't. You can't just go there and say, "Oh yeah, I'm a business." You've got but you have your you have tax free number. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have a tax number. With, co with corporations, they pay at the end of the year. Like for for all those all those things are taxed, but with a, fi a 501c3, you're not at all. Like it's completely deferred. Also, I think you can have nonprofit status. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can have nonprofit status, but be working towards your 501c3. Like after you apply for it, you can call yourself nonprofit, but you can't start getting the benefits of that until after. I think there's like a grace period, like a year or something. So, and and no, isn't it something like? At the end of the year, it's less well, it's less well, it's something it's between three and six months. I can't remember. I think it's probably different for smaller and bigger things too. Like if, if, or if, if you're a nonprofit, are you allowed to self-set? Am I understanding this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because because the thing is, it's considered. You're allowed to have nonprofit status if it's a hobby, and a hobby a hobby is anything that anything <coughs> that this is under the federal law. Anything that um, that makes a profit of less than sixty five hundred dollars. Per year, per year, and that and <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> after expenses. What's that? That's, that's after expenses. expenses. That's expenses. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, like, 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 <laughs> see, see if we make money, you put money, <laughs> oh, we, we put right back into expanding or something. Well, you can't, like, if you, make, profit. if you make more money, that means what, what that is, it, it's just you have to spend more money so that you come out under 6500 for the year. Right, okay, so as long as you spend it on something. You have to spend it, like, even if you spend, even if you make a donation from your own nonprofit to another nonprofit, that's, that works. Right. That, because, like, Maximum Rock and Wall, is a corporation and it's not profit, but every year they figure out how much money they need to have in their account to get into the lowest tax bracket so that they get charged a lower percentage of tax, okay? So when the year that I was there, they had $18,000 that they, in excess, that they wanted to get rid of so that they would be in the lower tax bracket. It's like when you hear of them like giving money to zine editors, that's why they do it. It's not necessarily like a goodwill towards editors or to the community it's for them because if they well because it's either if they don't give it away the government's going to take it in the tax right. so, so they give it some money to help some zines right <coughs> so that kind of not all the time. so we want to kind of move on the discussion um so if anybody has questions about non profit stuff they should talk to you Lita? yeah Lita or Scott okay. <laughs> and um, Scott you talk to them like later today does anyone over there I was just going to ask about board directors. Board directors. You can have well, you can have it arranged the same way as a sole proprietorship, where where you're one person doing it. If it's a nonprofit, it's not. If it's a nonprofit corporation, it works differently. But like it's it's more expensive actually to set up a nonprofit to set up an NPC nonprofit corporation. Um, that's that's like two hundred dollars. <laughs> Okay, so what other comments or suggestions do people have about raising money, selling museum? Selling museum, um, one thing I found is a lot of like, uh, this, is, this isn't really e like easy, but when you do um, email lists, some people do that, and if, even if you like have a friend who has a computer, it's on an email list, it's like a lot of them that like, even if you don't have access to a computer yourself, they might, they might have some of those lots of project listings on the internet that if you can just go, even go to a library and email people that do sites say, hey, can you list me your project listing? I, I personally don't go through this a lot, but other people say they do. And they're like, yeah, I found this on here, and it's great. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to go on computer. Spam is a point. Yeah. <laughs> well, but the list people are on, they've subscribed to, but they're like, I want to know about this stuff. Oh, not um, One thing that's more kind of a theoretical thing is having a very clear focus with your theme. Like, deciding where you want it to go and what you want it to either concentrate on or what style you want it to be in because that gives it more consistency like when they know when people know what to expect and to rely on like if you're like all over the place I mean it's cool because maybe you'll like develop this reputation as being a very eclectic kind of zine but sometimes it can work against you so the brand goal of some sort yeah you know having to like a focus is helpful and so then you can also get boxed into the thing of like your zine is this, and people are like, oh, you're the girl that does this zine. Or like, oh, that's a straight edge zine. That's a straight edge yeah. zine, or like, this is the, this is like, this is the zine of where they talk about getting raped all the time or something. And like, it, but the thing is, like, if, if people go through different periods of their life, like, if that's all somebody's gonna write about for a zine, like, if all they wanna write about is straight edge, like, whole zine, it's all they wanna write about. But then, like, the next time, so I don't know, some people have, like, this is the art issue, or this is the thinking issue, or something. That's good too. I don't see it as like vital. Like most of the things I read aren't, aren't focused at all. But you know. I mean, it's just like like Buckley doesn't focus. It's yeah. Not like one topic, but it has very clear direction of like I think it's consistent. Like the kind of thing. Kind of stuff. Oh, you, you mean like the attitude that I take in it, and and like Theo is like you know yeah. like we'll as opposed to being like this scene's poetry and this one's just drawing. Right. Or like, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. If you have all the stuff in it, then it's good. Somebody over here has. I was just I'm seeing some thinking about how you were talking about having a focus, and if, I think it's really helpful if there's something you really care about, like different political uh, concern. If you you know like defining a broader sense of community, because I think you know if you know what you're interested in writing about, it just and you can like work more with like um, political groups, and then they can become interested. I just I just think that would be a really good way too to just you know. Is it you who was talking about like expanding like your sense of community? Yeah, we have that in the final mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm. stuff about not limiting what you're talking about to the club scene. Like if there's yeah. something you're going to talk about and it's not 
directly related to the punk scene. Sometimes when you're talking about it in terms of the punk scene, people get alienated. Like people, like if you're talking about political issue, you <coughs> relate it all to the punk scene. If you talk to an activist, they get alienated because they don't relate to the punk scene at all. So kind of talking, kind of paying attention to who you're addressing when you're writing is important. Yeah, message. We'll do that too. Yeah. Message. <coughs> yeah, I think I think you're right. Just from the distributor perspective. Like, I mean, we see zines that, there's some pretty big name zines that are really half activist, I mean, and, and really seriously activist focused, and the other half very scene punk hardcore focused. Zine in particular. I was thinking of Retrogression, if anyone's ever read Retrogression. But I've talked to Dave, the editor, he's a friend of mine. He says, you know, it's hard because. I mean, ideally, punk kids wouldn't see it and be like, oh, cool, look, all this good punk stuff in here, and buy it because of that. And hard, and activists would see this, look, all this great political stuff and buy it because of that. But his experience has sort of been that activists are like, you know, what's all this other crap? And kind of pass it over. So and punk sort of say, yeah. this is too in depth for what I'm interested in this, and pass it over. So there's some sort of trade offs. But also, I was just thinking, one thing that I haven't really been talked about in advertising or zine. <coughs> Is that just really try to produce a quality product that's well polished? And by polished, I don't necessarily mean you know it's real slick and has color covers and, and nice uh, you know expensive printing and trimming and all this. But just to like you know put out something that that's really worth that you would buy. You know, ask yourself would I would I pick this up if I didn't know me? Would I be interested in this? And and sort of. Spell check it, you know, make sure it's legible and you can read it, if you can write it, write it neatly or just type it, you know, whatever. But just, I mean, the first few things I put out were pretty sloppy and, I mean, I got, I got rejected by all the, even the small distributors, you know, they're just like, uh, you know, I'm sorry, or whatever. And, you know, we, we go through that all the time, you know, we get huge crates of zines. I mean, you know, just every day we get a stack of, of, for consideration and it's like just the sheer volume on it, you know, based on sheer volume, we have to be really selective. And plus it's like, is this going to, I mean, will, will people pick this up off a table, you know, it, it, among a bunch of zines? Would this be something people would be interested in? And just quality is going to sell itself to some degree and that's an important consideration. Another kind of um, add-on on to that is don't put your zine down. If you're like, well, it's not that great, but yeah, no, yeah. yeah. that's what like, we're rejecting it immediately sucks, if it starts know, out. Like, I think it sucks, but you might like it. It's like you know what? If you're not going like your it. zine, don't. <laughs> it's not worth it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, trades, people are like, this isn't very good. I'm like, well, you're right, it's not. I'm not right. It goes right <laughs> in the free box at Tree Knowledge. Like if we get something in the mail and we open it up and it says, oh, you know, this seems really pretty crummy, but I did it anyway, or whatever. Right. Just like, it's like if you're not going to put the effort into it to make it something that you think is amazing, Washington other people is not. Other people aren't going to think it's amazing. Do you want it? Yeah. Do you have a comment on it? Oh, I'm just you're saying. like you have your hand like this. Well, so it's like, kind of uh, resting, but, <laughs> but I was thinking. I just wanted to agree with what you were saying. I think that um, people need to consider what <coughs> what kind of audience they want to have, and I think that a lot of people are very focused. Um, I think that saying this is a punk scene and this is for punk, using a lot of punk lingo, this is just an example, could alienate a lot of people who aren't familiar with it but have the same ideas. You know, like, I didn't even know what punk was really until a year ago, but I still have the same values that I have now, and I'm finding that I have a lot of the same values. Anti corporatism is not right. select or exclusive. <laughs> it's not like yeah. I, didn't, I didn't want to know what a scene was, I just didn't have access to it. And when I first picked one up, I felt like it had all this lingo and and stuff that maybe I didn't even know what DIY stood for. I knew what do-it-yourself was. My friends and I had been making our own stuff all along. We just didn't use that lingo. And um, I mean, maybe I'm exposing myself as being a dork, but <laughs> right. But I'm just saying. Yeah, that girl from the workshop. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> but it's just something to consider. I mean, I think it's cool that there's a community and cool that there's a name for that community and that there are. And there's nothing wrong with lingo, but just be aware that there might be other people out there. And the more people you get who have that, 
who can understand your ideas and share them and spread them, probably the better, you know? And that's all. So I found that like distributing like in stores, like quarter zines, quarter size zines, they sit there yeah. forever. And like okay. unless they're like, real like really good looking or something, they're like colored and like, like there was this like copy of Doris, this construction paper cover with spray paint, yeah. and people totally bought that and they were like, yeah, cool. But then like uh, yeah, I had a quarter size zine sitting at this record store for like ever, and like all my half size zines would sell out and they'd be yeah. gone, and the quarter size zines would still be sitting there. I used to work at a store. We were, I was able to. I mean, part of it was because I would sell them. But I was able to clear every quarter size and came I in. I think they rock. That's it's like, like so actively. Yeah, I mean that was doing it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but I mean, there's like there's issues with like every format. You know, some yeah. people like half size. And like I hate full size, but I like doing layout on full size pages. So I like yeah. this thing. I like doing quarter size, but I'm like I just did a quarter size one. It's like everything. I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> yeah, so. um, we only have like a few minutes left. So, well, at first I have a couple of but I want to remind everybody that this new conference coming up at Holy Green. We have information about it at our table, which is right outside on the box here. And um, the other thing is that I'm leaving at 3.30, so if <coughs> anybody wants to talk to me about anything or buy stuff from us, we're like, can we sell everything because we don't want to take it back on the airplane? <laughs> um, just make sure you do it soon because we got information. And I know that. They're probably taking up right after their workshop to you, Theo. Yeah, we'll be around four. Yeah. So, so wants to make your purchases early. Mm -hmm. I hate, I totally hate like plugging this stuff though. But I have to do it. New Senior Book is coming out. It's at the printer right now. It'll be out in June. I can't, I still haven't decided if it's going to be $6 or if I'm going to raise the cover price. So for now, it's $6. And, um, and I, yeah, as soon as Theo finishes the part. I'm doing the layout and it'll be um, <laughs> to the printer at the end of the month. Yeah. Or it should be back oh, and um, we use a printer in Florida called Small, Small Publishers Co-op. And we awesome. had a lot of really, they, I think they're really awesome. Um, Postal Press isn't around cool. anymore. I used to work for them. It is. I mean, you, we, Theo and I, or not Theo, Scott and I were talking about how they might be printing again, but they, they are aren't doing it publicly. Sure. Yeah, for sure they are. Um, they're doing it publicly. So, if you want information on them, um, small publishers go out. I mean, they make it really affordable for They're people awesome. like small runs. They're really easy to work with, and they have a great turnaround time. I like small quality. Them. Yeah, our catalogs like were done there. Jim's new zine was done. Yeah, the Fuck You Twenty Three, which is out there, was done there. It's really nice. So I had a complete mistake in my zine, and I called them like the day before they were going to print it, and they like went in and like fixed. You know, my spelling mistake and stuff for me, and we're totally yeah. cool about it. They're the nicest. They're thing also um, printing the new year book, which is they don't do perfect binding, and they're willing to deal with all the craziness of the project. Too. Don't they only do newsprint? They don't do newsprint. Fuck you, on white bond paper. They do 50 pound white paper, which is slightly lighter than normal printing paper, which is 60 pound, but it looks great.